Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to get started, and I've already been criticized by Mark for my grammatical error in the title of my talk. So today I'm going to talk about novel approaches to predicting outcome, comma, and novel therapeutics in IgA nephropathy. Um, so these are my disclosures. I'll come back to some industry relationships later when we talk about clinical trials uh, in, in IgA nephropathy. But first we're going to talk about predicting renal outcome in IgA nephropathy. We're then going to take a brief review of the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy and then try to tie that into novel therapeutic approaches with targeted treatments uh, for IgA. So we all know that the risk of renal progression in IG nephropathy is highly variable, and, and this was highlighted quite well by Heather Reisch in a study in 2007, in which she stratified patients according to their average proteinuria over the entire duration of follow-up and demonstrated quite a wide range in risk of end-stage renal disease, which highlights the fact that patients with IG nephropathy have a very, quite variable risk of progression. However, this doesn't really help us in clinical practice when we don't actually know someone's proteinuria over the entire duration of follow-up. So what we're going to focus on today is, if we're sitting back here at the time of biopsy, how do we predict someone's future risk of progression moving forward without requiring the entire follow-up duration worth of proteinuria? So when we talk about risk stratification in IG nephropathy, what I mean is the ability to accurately predict the risk of individual renal function decline using variables that are readily available in clinical practice. So if you're going to use predictor variables that you don't have available in clinical practice, there's really no point in using them in, in a risk stratification algorithm. If we're going to use pathology, we need to use a scoring system that's been widely accepted and available on routine biopsy reports. Again, if you don't have access to the scoring system, then it's not all that useful for risk stratification, and it needs to have been demonstrated to be reproducible and, and valid. We need to be able to apply our risk stratification algorithm at clinically relevant time points, hopefully with very minimal need for long-term follow-up. Ideally, we'd like to be able to do this closer to the time of biopsy, and the longer you have to follow a patient before making a risk stratification decision, the less clinically relevant that, that approach is going to be. And we'd also like to be able to apply our risk stratification algorithm in multiple ethnic groups worldwide, especially given the multi-ethnic uh, variability in IG nephropathy. So why do we care about risk stratification in IG nephropathy? The most obvious answer is so that we can inform patients of their anticipated prognosis. You know, on one hand, uh, you've just diagnosed a patient with kidney disease. If you can identify low-risk patients, you might be able to alleviate them of, of the anxiety around that diagnosis. On the other hand, if you can identify high-risk patients, you can target healthcare resources towards those high-risk patients. A second objective, however, is more complex, which is the idea of identifying patients at sufficiently high risk of progression in order to justify immunosuppression. So I think certainly with the uh, recent publications of the STOP IGA and testing trials, we have a very good understanding of the substantial risks of corticosteroids, at least, in, in, in IG nephropathy. But the other side of this equation, of course, is the risk of disease progression. So if we want to balance these two things, we need to understand the absolute risk of disease progression to weigh that against the risks of immunosuppression. So there are certainly multiple risk factors for disease progression that have been established in, in, in the literature, uh, clinical risk factors, I mean, such as GFR, blood pressure, and proteinuria. And so there have been countless observational studies that have demonstrated that these variables have a significant and independent association with, with renal outcome. There are, however, clinical risk factors that are uncertain. These include age, sex, race, BMI, and hematuria. There are pathology risk factors, such as the MESC score, which we'll talk more about in the next slide, at least in terms of crescents. There are uh, novel risk factors, many studies looking at novel risk factors in IG nephropathy, including biomarkers, such as galactose-deficient IgA levels or anti-glycan antibodies, uh, novel pathology findings, such as C4D staining, genetics, or other biomarkers. And suffice, suffice it to say, none of these have been sufficiently validated uh, to be recommended for use in routine clinical practice. What's not clear, though, is how you combine these together. So, for example, if someone has high-risk proteinuria but a low-risk pathology score, do those two things cancel each other out and you're left with someone with sort of intermediate risk? We, we have absolutely no idea. Furthermore, we need to understand what the absolute risk of progression is, right? So when I talked about balancing the risks versus benefits of treatment, you need to know what the absolute risk of progression is. It's not sufficient to say someone has one or two or three risk factors if you don't actually know what kind of risk that translates into. So what about crescents? There was a recent publication by Mark Haas uh, in um, 2017 
that used a relatively large cohort of 3,100 patients to look at the, the, the association of crescents with, with outcome. So when I talk about crescents here, the first thing to note is we're talking about, on average, 10% of glomeruli with crescents. So this is not crescentic IG nephropathy. This is not IG nephropathy presenting with an RPGN presentation. This is run-of-the-mill, average, chronic, slowly progressive IgA that tends to have a few crescents. What he showed was that uh, the presence of cellular or fibrocellular crescents in over 25% of glomeruli was associated with a higher risk of disease progression irrespective of whether you were given immunosuppression. And the presence of crescents in, in uh, fewer than 25% of glomeruli was associated with the risk of progression, but only in patients who were not given immunosuppression. So based on this and other studies, there was an, actually an update published in 2016 regarding the MESH score. So uh, the MEST components of the MESH score have been shown to be associated with, uh, partially or completely associated with, with outcome in multiple cohort studies since the original publication in 2009. So this update in 2016 actually makes the recommendation that all biopsies showing IG nephropathy with a sufficient number of glomeruli should have a MESH score reported. <clears throat> They also recommend down here that there should be the addition of the C-score, which is based on cellular fibrocellular crescents in uh, uh, fewer than 25% of glomeruli giving you a C1 score, or in more than 25% of glomeruli giving you a C2 score. So what do the KDGO guidelines recommend? Well, they make a recommendation 10.1 that all patients with IG nephropathy should be assessed for the risk of progressive disease that you can use a combination of blood pressure, renal function, and proteinuria, and that you may want to consider pathology features. These are not graded recommendations. They're based on expert opinion, but they also don't tell you how to do this. So it's not an overly useful uh, a guideline recommendation. In terms of corticosteroid treatment, they suggest that you risk stratify patients based on proteinuria greater than one gram per day, suggesting that patients who have persistent proteinuria above one gram per day are at sufficiently high risk that you might want to consider corticosteroids. So the question we want to ask is, do we think that proteinuria categorization greater than one gram per day is actually sufficient to achieve both of these concepts? I think the answer to that is no. So we published in uh, 2016 uh, a study where we looked at the group of patients with GFRs over 50, and we looked at the risk of a 50% decline in GFR or end-stage renal disease. So in the purple line here, is the group of patients that have persistent proteinuria between one and two grams per day. So this is a group of patients that would qualify for corticosteroids according to the key DEGO guidelines. If you look at the green line here, this is a group of patients that have lower levels of proteinuria, but they have a high risk M1 lesion. So these patients have basically the exact same risk of disease progression, but yet they don't qualify for corticosteroids because of their lower uh, proteinuria. Conversely, if you look at the brown line here, this is a group of patients that have proteinuria between 1 and 1.5 grams per day, but they have low-risk M0-T0 lesions. So these, these patients uh, do qualify for corticosteroids because of their proteinuria, but in fact their risk of progression is much, much lower. So what this suggests at least that proteinuria, at least at one time point, is not all that useful to risk stratify patients or to make treatment decisions. So if proteinuria at one time point isn't useful, what about looking at more prolonged periods of follow-up? So this was originally introduced by Bartosik in 2001, uh, where he attempted to uh, predict the rate of renal function decline. What he showed is that if you use blood pressure and proteinuria values averaged over sequentially longer periods of follow-up, including up to five years, you do a better job of predicting the rate of renal function decline. However, this is obviously not very clinically useful. We don't want to have to follow somebody for five years in order to predict what their future renal function decline is going to be when you've already actually observed what's going to happen. We'd ideally like to be able to do that back here at the time of biopsy. But what's certainly true is that more prolonged periods of follow-up can give you better risk prediction. What about race as a predictor of disease progression? So again, we looked at this using the Toronto GN registry data back in 2013 and we looked at Asians versus non-Asians adjusted for various other confounders and described a 56% higher risk of end-stage renal disease in Asian patients compared to non-Asian patients in, in the greater Toronto area. So this suggested that race might be an important predictor of progression. However, a very real limitation to this study is that we did not have access to uh, pathology values, so we couldn't adjust for the MESH score. So what remains uncertain is whether Asian patients remain at higher risk after you account for basic pathology features on a biopsy. So what about prediction models? Certainly this would give you the capacity to combine different predictors together. 
It would theoretically give you an absolute risk of disease progression. And this has been studied in multiple different publications. I've listed them here. The challenge is, is that many of these studies have some significant limitations. They've, they've been done in perhaps ethnically homogeneous groups of patients, which limits their external application to multi-ethnic patients you might see in clinical practice. They've used pathology scoring systems, such as either the global optical score, the Japanese system, or the Lee system, which are not routinely available on, on, on clinical reports and have actually not demonstrated to be reproducible between pathologists. Or they've either had no external validation or only partial external validation, which again limits your capacity to apply these prediction models in clinical practice. So one of the, the, the major barriers to doing this kind of research is the absence of large international data sets that allow you to separately val uh, de derive and subsequently validate um, a prediction model. So in summary, um, the, you know, we have well-established risk factors uh, uh, for disease progression, including GFR, proteinuria, blood pressure, and now the updated MEST-C score. Intuitively, however, we consider individual predictors separately. And, and we know that this is inaccurate. It's probably not sufficient for risk stratification, and it can lead to erroneous treatment decisions. And currently, there is no accepted prediction model for integrating these risk factors together. So I want to consider three hypothetical patients now. So for the sake of argument, let's assume all of them have the same MESH score. Um, uh, they've all uh, been treated with, uh, with RAS blockade prior to their biopsy. There are slight differences in age, in, in race, uh, slight differences in blood pressure, and again, slight differences in proteinuria. So the question we want to ask is, which of these patients is at higher risk of progression, and by how much? I think if we were to intuitively guess, we would say probably patient one is going to be at highest risk, right? He's got the lowest GFR, slightly higher proteinuria, certainly higher risk than patient three. How much higher risk? I have no idea. What about patient one versus patient two? They have similar GFRs and only very small differences in proteinuria. What's the difference in risk between patient one and patient two? So we're going to come back to these three patients later on. So uh, now I'd like to present some recent work we've done on uh, an international prediction model in IG nephropathy, where our goal here was to derive and externally validate a model that can be applied in multiple ethnic groups at the time of biopsy, and therefore try to address some of the limitations I'd previously mentioned about the existing literature in this area. So this was a uh, truly international collaboration between investigators from around the world, including from China and Japan, uh, continental Europe, the UK, as well as North and South America. There are certainly far more investigators than I've listed here, including sub-investigators that did a lot of work of collating data that we were then able to merge together uh, for the purposes of this, this project. So without their support, we certainly would not have been able to make this project happen. So we included in this analysis only adults greater than 18 years old who did not have end-stage renal disease at the time of biopsy. Obviously, there's no point in predicting outcome in someone who already has ESRD. The outcome that we uh, uh, chose to predict was a 50% decline in GFR or ESRD. This is a description of the derivation and validation cohort. So we split our data sets up into a derivation and then external validation cohort. I'll point out a few features here. The first is that they're pretty large by IGA standards. So, so there's 2,700 patients in the derivation cohort and, and uh, almost 1,200 in the validation cohort. They're followed for, on average, five years. We did achieve reasonable multi-ethnic representation, at least across Caucasians, Japanese, and Chinese patients. On average, renal function was preserved. Patients had between uh, uh, 1, uh, 1 to 2 grams of protein, and uh, most patients were treated with RAS blockade during the follow-up period. So this is pretty typical of what you'd expect from an IG nephropathy research cohort. The risk of a 50% decline in, in, uh, of GFR or end-stage renal disease was around 14% or so, 14 to 15% in both the derivation validation cohort at five years. Again, this is pretty typical of what you would expect in uh, average IG nephropathy. So we looked at uh, several models here. Uh, we, we looked at a clinical model, which was really by way of comparison uh, to include the GFR, blood pressure, and proteinuria at the time of biopsy because these are as I mentioned, the strongest clinical risk factors for progression. And then we looked at two full models, which were really uh, derived using the data that we had. Uh, one full model included race, and one full model did not include race. And the reason we made a model without race was so that it could potentially be applied in other ethnic groups other than the Caucasian, Japanese, or Chinese patients that dominated our, our cohort. 
We did consider crescents as a potential predictor variable in both models, but in neither model was it, were they selected as an independent predictor of progression. So this is the prediction performance in the derivation cohort of the two models. So what this shows is that both full models with race or without race did a better job of predicting outcome compared to the clinical model. So that didn't matter whether you looked at model fit, which we assessed using something called the Ikeki information criteria or the R squared value. Both were better in the full models. Both full models had better discrimination as assessed by the C statistic. And both had better reclassification as measured by these uh, measures of reclassification called the NRI or IDI. When we compared the two full models head to head, there was really no difference between them, suggesting you can use either the full model with race or without race to predict outcome. And when we repeated this in the external validation cohort, we got very similar prediction performance. So this is an example of our calibration results. So just to orient you along the x-axis here, we have predicted five-year risk of progression. Along the y-axis, we have observed five-year risk of progression. In an ideal model that has perfect calibration, your predicted risk would be exactly equal to your observed risk. So if I tell you you have a predicted risk of 15% of risk of progression, that is exactly uh, uh, the, the observed risk that you would have um, in, in real life. So in, in, with ideal calibration, all of these dots would fall along this dotted line. So in the derivation core, you can see that we do achieve a, a pretty good calibration. But most importantly, we also observed very, very good calibration in the external validation cohort. So this was a very strong calibration result. So as you recall, our primary outcome here was a 50% decline in GFR or end-stage renal disease. So what we did is we, uh, we, we, we grouped patients based on categories of risk. So we put people into low, intermediate, high, and highest risk of our primary outcome. And then we looked at the rate of renal function decline across these categories in terms of mLs per minute per year. And what we showed is that the rate of renal function decline was significantly higher in higher risk categories. So what this demonstrates is that the models are robustly capturing patients whose disease actually is progressing at a faster rate. There is some controversy around using a rate of renal function decline versus a threshold reduction in GFR as a relevant outcome in kidney disease. And what this demonstrates is that the models are relatively robust to either of those. And it truly, they truly are capturing patients whose disease is progressing more rapidly. So in summary, either of these risk prediction models can be used to accurately predict renal outcome in IG nephropathy. If you want to apply them, the variables you need are the MESS score. However, you strictly speaking do not need the crescents. GFR, blood pressure, and proteinuria at the time of biopsy age, the use of RAS blockade of biopsy, and the use of immunosuppression prior to biopsy, and you may choose to use the model with or without race. So importantly, these results have been confirmed in an external validation analysis so that they can be applied in multiple ethnic groups. There are very important limitations here that we need to consider. Firstly, these models should not be applied in the pediatric setting, not that this is particularly relevant to to, to this audience, but certainly this is of interest worldwide, and, and these models were not designed to be applied in, in pediatrics. They are, strictly speaking, only applicable at the time of biopsy. So, so when we were, were deriving our prediction models, we were using variables within a, a short time period of the biopsy, and they should not be used in IG vasculitis. So these results have now been published in JAM Internal Medicine, so if you want to read the full peer-reviewed uh, uh, manuscripts, uh, you can go read that online. It hasn't been published in print yet, but it's available as an EPUB. And we, we fully recognize that a survival model is not exactly the easiest model to implement in clinical practice. You certainly go, you can't, you know, on the back of a piece of paper calculate someone's risk of progression. So to get around that fact, we collaborated with Daniel Schwartz and FHA um, uh, through Calculate by QXMD to uh, generate a mobile app calculator. And you can, uh, on your mobile device, download Calculate for free. And now within the glomerulonephritis section, is the, is the risk calculator that you can use. If you don't want to use a mobile app calculator, you can also use a web-based calculator uh, available at the link here. So how does the mobile app calculator work? Well, as I mentioned, you go to the app store, download the app, and it's grouped by specialty. So there's nephrology, cardiology, gastroenterology, et cetera. So if you just pick nephrology, under nephrology is glomerulonephritis, and under that you'll find the International IG Nephropathy Prediction Tool. So you just enter all of the different predictor values that are required. You also have to select the time frame, the time horizon that you're trying to predict an outcome. 
So we generally use five years in our, in our analyses. You can pick any time frame you want up to seven years. So we've limited it to not allow you to select longer than that simply because we didn't have that much follow-up data after seven years. So the results become quite, quite inaccurate. And at the end of the day, what it outputs is, your, is the risk of 50% decline in GFR or end-stage renal disease for your patient at the time frame that you've selected. So there are some further applications to the prediction tool. Uh, the first is that we, we need to decide how we're going to integrate this into risk-based treatment approaches. And I'll talk more about this in a few slides, but ideally we'd like to be able to use an individual patient's risk of progression uh, to make treatment decisions rather than a simple categorization of proteinuria. We need more research in this area before we can do it. There is the opportunity now to enrich clinical trial cohorts with higher risk patient populations so that the study has improved power, uh, potentially reducing the need, for, uh, the sample size requirement and therefore also the feasibility and cost of a clinical trial in IG nephropathy. It also offers some key infrastructure that, that can allow validation of biomarkers in the clinical domain. So one of the major limitations of biomarker research is that they tend to um, uh, not have been externally validated to demonstrate an improved prediction beyond what's already available from, from routine clinical variables. Having a prediction model already available allows you to do that in a much smaller cohort than would otherwise be required if you wanted to do it de novo. So let's come back to our three hypothetical patients. So if you recall, we had patient one that had slightly lower GFR and higher proteinuria, patient two that was relatively similar with slightly lower proteinuria but a different race, and then patient three uh, that had higher GFR uh, and similar proteinuria to patient two. So when we go ahead and apply our prediction model to these three patients, we get very different results. So we find out that patient one is a 50% risk of progression, patient two is a 21% risk of progression, and patient three only has an 11% risk of progression. So I think what this demonstrates is that, you know, intuitively we probably would have guessed this order. Uh, however, I don't think we would have appreciated the true magnitude of difference here. So patient one has a five times higher risk of progression than patient three, and is quite substantially higher risk than patient two. And what this demonstrates is we really don't do a good job of adding up in our minds the sum total of all the small different uh, effects of individual predictors that can add up to very large differences in predicted risk. Now, as it turns out, these are not random patients. These are actually the baseline characteristics of the testing trial steroid arm, the stop IgA overall treatment arm, and the stop IgA steroid arm. Now, we don't have the MESS results for stop IgA, so that's why I assume that they were the same across the studies. But what this demonstrates is that the steroid treatment arm of the testing trial was systematically at much, much lower risk than the testing trial. So it's not necessarily a surprise that the STOP IGA trial failed to show any impact on GFR outcomes when it was never powered to do that in the first place. It had no hope whatsoever of identifying GFR-based outcomes. The testing trial, however, was much higher risk. So for that reason, it may be in a better position to demonstrate effects on GFR. So this highlights the importance of understanding the risk uh, of the patient population getting into a clinical trial. So in conclusion, our current methods of risk stratification use simplistic categorization of individual predictors. These are inaccurate and can't be combined. Using cl clinical predictors over more prolonged periods of follow-up improves prediction, but it's not really all that clinically applicable. And now the international prediction tool does provide the ability uh, for the first time to generate accurate risk prediction near the time of biopsy so that personalized accurate risk stratification is now readily available in, in IGA. So let's, let's change now and talk about risk-based treatment decisions. So what do I mean by that? Let me just define that when I talk about disease progression, what I mean is the risk of experiencing a 50% decline in GFR or ESRD, which is the same outcome that we use in the prediction tool. And when I talk about predicted risk, what I mean is a predicted risk from the prediction tool. So if we acknowledge these two, uh, th these two uh, definitions, we can define a risk-based treatment algorithm. So instead of using proteinuria, we can envision a scenario where we might evaluate someone's individual risk. There might be some magical threshold risk of progression, we'll call it just P. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's a threshold risk. And if an individual patient's risk is above that threshold, I might choose to treat them with immunosuppression. And if it's below that threshold, I will choose not to treat them with immunosuppression. In both of these scenarios, though, I may have been right and I may have been wrong. So the patients who were treated with immunosuppression, their disease might have otherwise progressed without immunosuppression. On the other hand, it might not have progressed. I might have been wrong. Similarly, patients 
who I chose not to treat with immunosuppression may have experienced disease progression anyways, and ideally they would not have experienced progression. So if I, if I acknowledge that this is a risk-based treatment decision, we can then define what we can call true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. So a true positive treatment decision is when I decide to treat somebody with immunosuppression and their disease actually would have progressed. So that was a correct decision that I made to treat them. A false positive decision, however, is when I choose to treat somebody with immunosuppression, but their disease never would have progressed in the first place. So that was incorrect. Probably should not have done that. A false negative decision, or sorry, a true negative decision would be when I treat, choose not to treat somebody with immunosuppression and their disease would not have progressed. That was a correct decision to make. Conversely, a, fa a false negative decision is someone whom I decided not to treat with immunosuppression, but in fact their disease would have progressed. So if, 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 we, if we consider it in this framework, if I knew what the quality of life was under each one of these true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative decisions, if I had very good data on quality of life and the implications to patients under each one of those scenarios, I could theoretically work my way backwards and calculate what this magical threshold probability is that would tell you in clinical practice you should treat patients whose risk is greater than that threshold probability. That would be a possibility. The major challenge here, of course, is I don't have good quality of life data under those circumstances. I have no idea what they are. It's very, very limited from the, from the literature. So what I can then do, I can then actually flip the question around. Let me just acknowledge that there is some threshold probability. I don't know what it is. I have absolutely no idea what it is. But I know that it exists. And at that threshold probability, there's perfect equipoise where the quality of life under treatment and the quality of life under no treatment are exactly equal. So it is the threshold probability of absolutely perfect equipoise. Again, I don't know what it is, but I acknowledge that it must exist. If I make that assumption, we can then use that threshold probability to make treatment decisions. I can say whatever that threshold probability is, if your risk of progression is greater than that, I will choose to treat you with immunosuppression. And if your risk of progression is less than the threshold probability, I will choose not to treat you. Again, I don't know what it is, but I can envision a scenario in which I can make these kinds of decisions. It turns out, through the miracle of uh, statistics, we'll just leave it at that, that you can work your way backwards and calculate the relative harm to patients based on quality of life from false positive versus false negative decisions based on this threshold probability. And the important part here is you do not actually need to measure quality of life to do this. If you acknowledge that the threshold probability exists, you can work your way backwards to do it. And if you do that, you can then calculate two important outcomes. One is called the net benefit, and one is called the net reduction in treatment. So the net benefit is actually the proportion of patients that I would correctly treat with immunosuppression, but adjusting for incorrect decisions I made and the impact that those incorrect decisions had on patient quality of life. And I can do that again without actually measuring quality of life. The next item you can uh, assess is something called the net reduction in treatment, which is very similar, but it's the proportion of patients you correctly withheld immunosuppression from adjusted for the impact of false decisions on patient quality of life. So what you can do then is, is, is generate different decision rules for immunosuppression. So you can take the, the maverick approach of I'm going to treat absolutely everyone with immunosuppression. It doesn't matter what the characteristics are. Every single person with IgA gets immunosuppression. You could take the JJ approach. I'm going to treat absolutely nobody with immunosuppression. It doesn't matter what their risk of progression actually is. I can make more refined decisions based on predicted risk from the prediction tool and whether it's above or below a threshold probability. Or I can decide to treat people based on proteinuria greater than one gram per day. And the reason for that is that as per KDGO guidelines, that is the cutoff probability that you would decide to potentially consider corticosteroids at least. So if you acknowledge these decision rules, you can calculate the net benefit curve. So, so let me orient you here. So on the y-axis, we have the net benefit, which is, again, the proportion of patients you have correctly allocated to treatment adjusted for the impact on quality of life from, from incorrect decisions. So a net benefit above zero is a benefit to a patient. A net benefit below zero is uh, detrimental to patients. So what we did is you just simply calculate the net benefit across every single threshold probability spanning the range from 0% up to 100%. So again, I don't know what the threshold probability is. I just repeat my calculation for every possible threshold probability. In the green line, we have the net benefit curve for proteinuria. So if you choose to treat patients based on proteinuria alone, what this demonstrates is that the immunosuppression treatment decisions based on proteinuria are net harmful to patients for threshold probabilities above 18%. Okay, so that's really not very good. 
The red and the black curves are the net benefit curves for the two different prediction models with or without race. So what it demonstrates is that you get better net benefit than, you, than proteinuria for almost all uh, uh, threshold probabilities. And once you get up to very high cutoffs, like 40 to 60 percent, it becomes functionally equivalent to uh, uh, treating no one. And the reason for that, of course, is that there are so few patients whose risk of progression is actually above 40 to 60 percent that having a cutoff that high is functionally equivalent to deciding on treating nobody. So this is another way of looking at it. So this is the difference in net benefit between the model with race compared to proteinuria or the model without race compared to proteinuria. So what this demonstrates is that for threshold probabilities above 11 percent, your model with race has a significant improvement in net benefit compared to making treatment decisions based on proteinuria alone. The solid line here is the point estimate, and the shaded region is the 95% confidence interval. And when you extend this out, what you discover is that up to 22% more patients can be more accurately allocated to immunosuppression using the prediction models compared to using proteinuria alone. If you flip this around in terms of the net reduction in treatment, which is, again, the proportion of patients you correctly withhold treatment from, adjusted from the, for the impact of, of incorrect treatment decisions on patient quality of life, and again, we have in the green line here, this is, this is the curve for proteinuria, and in the red and um, the black lines are the curves for the two different prediction models. What you can see is for threshold probabilities above 8%, the prediction models do a far better job of correctly identifying low-risk patients that you should not treat with immunosuppression compared to using proteinuria. And in fact, you can identify up to 30% more patients more accurately to withhold immunosuppression from compared to if you use proteinuria alone. So what this demonstrates is that treatment decisions based on personalized risk from the prediction model, as opposed to using proteinuria alone at one gram per day, do a far better job and have a better impact for patients on treatment decisions. If you want to, in terms of allocating immunosuppression, the, uh, the models do a better job for threshold probabilities above 9 to 11 percent. And in terms of withholding immunosuppression, they do a better job for threshold probabilities above 8 percent. So how does this compare to the actual risk for individual patients? So what I have here is a distribution curve of the five-year risk for patients with IG nephropathy. And what you can see, as you'd expect, most patients are sitting here around 5 or 10%. So these threshold probabilities fall right within this range where most patients have an intermediate risk and most patients with IG nephropathy reside, indicating that treatment decisions based on the prediction models have the capacity to significantly impact care for the majority of patients with, with IG nephropathy, as opposed to using a simple categorization of proteinuria. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop there in terms of predicting outcome, and we're going to take now a brief review of the uh, pathogenesis of IG nephropathy. So the current pathogenesis of IG nephropathy involves a multi-hit hypothesis. So the, the, the first hit is that you have abnormal immunity within the mucosal uh, immune system. This may be due to stimulation from mucosal infections or mucosal antigens, and it may be mediated through toll-like receptors. You get priming of B cells. These B cells normally are supposed to go to local lymphoid tissues and then come back to the uh, enteric mucosa. However, the thought is that they get confused, and they set up shop probably in the bone marrow, although we don't know that for certain, and secrete galactose-deficient Ig1 molecules into the circulation. A second hit is that you get anti-glycan antibodies forming. So you get, set, you get antibodies formed against the galactose-deficient IgA1 molecules. These can either be IgG or IgA antibodies that form large immune complexes in the circulation that then deposit in the kidney. The third hit, though, is that you have to have renal injury as a result of those immune complexes. The sum total of all these effects produces what we call Ig nephropathy. So what is galactose-deficient IgA1? So IgA1 is a molecule that has a hinge region with a lot of serine and threonine on it. Th this hinge region can be galactosylated um, either through the, through the addition of N-acetylgalactosamine. Once you add a sialic acid residue, it tends to terminate glycosylation. So under normal circumstances, you have uh, a state of relatively significant galactosylation of the IgA1 molecule. In Ig nephropathy, however, it's a state of under-glycosylation. It's thought that this was developed in humans as a way of uh, evading IgA proteases from enteric organisms that are seeking to, uh, you know, infect our, our bodies through the GI tract, and that's why we do normally produce galactose-deficient IgA1 molecules. It's just that they're supposed to be secreted into your enteric lumen, not, not into your blood. Normally, we do not have much of this floating around in our blood. <clears throat> 
So how do we get production of, of galactose deficient Ig1? Well, again, there's the thought that you get it through environmental antigen stimulation or through mucosal infections, which may be mediated through toll-like receptors that then activate B cells. There's also the concept that there's overactivation of B cells, possibly mediated through BAF, which is, called, which is a B cell activating factor that results in overstimulation of B cells, which then get confused and set up shop in systemic sites. As I mentioned, they produce the galactose deficient Ig1 molecules. You then get secondary generation of anti-glycan antibodies, which form these immune complexes. The immune complexes can then deposit in the kidney. However, we know that immune complex deposition in the kidney and uh, production of immune complexes are necessary but not sufficient for development of the disease. If you walk around and measure galactose deficient Ig1 levels or biopsy every person you find on the street in Southeast Asia, you will find uh, uh, elevated levels or deposition in the kidney in patients without Ig nephropathy. So what you need is a secondary response to the, to the immune complex deposition in the tissue, whether it's through mesangial cell activation or through, through complement, uh, the complement system that then um, uh, produces renal injury. So, so how do you get these uh, 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 immune complexes? So as I mentioned, you have secondary uh, production of anti-glycan antibodies. This can either be through exposure of neoepitopes in the galactose deficient hinge region that we're not used to seeing and you get an immune response to it. There also is a thought that there may be cross-reactivity between microbial um, uh, 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 peptides and the galactose deficient region, which might explain why there's a correlation between enteric infections, which a sudden increase in anti-glycan antibodies that floods the system with immune complexes, resulting in transient increases in disease activity, for example, during infections. However, these galactose deficient Ig molecules can also self-polymerize and form larger complexes. There's also the concept that there may be uh, involvement of soluble CD89. So CD89 is a, usually a tissue-bound receptor for IgA, which gets uh, some people have reported uh, is the soluble um, component of this can be incorporated into the uh, immune complexes. So what do these immune complexes do? Well, they deposit in the kidney, and as I mentioned, they need to have a secondary response. So they can activate mesangial cells which release pro-inflammatory mediators, which induce influx of inflammatory cells um, uh, into the capillary lumens, producing endocapillary hypocellularity, which result in mesangial cell proliferation, uh, resulting in mesangial hypocellularity, or when it's uncontrolled, can result in uh, crescent formation. However, there's also the concept of glomerular podocytic and glomerular tubular crosstalk. So what I mean by that is you have pro-inflammatory mediators that induce podocyte injury, you have proteinuria, a part of the proteinuria is a galactose deficient Ig1 immune complex can get past your glomerular basement membrane and directly bind to podocytes causing podocyte injury, which is one of the uh, hypothesized mechanisms by which you have a direct uh, podocyte injury and segmental sclerosis, or can actually bind to the proximal tubular epithelial cell and induce uh, tubular interstitial fibrosis. It is thought that perhaps the mesangial cell activation from IgA molecules might be mediated through the spleen tyrosine kinase pathway, and, and we'll come back to that very briefly later. So what about the complement system in Ig nephropathy? I would argue that we've known that the complement system has been relevant since the uh, discovery of Ig nephropathy. So when you biopsy a patient and you have a PAS slide here, you see that, that, that there are areas of the glomerulus that are pretty normal, and there are areas of the glomerulus that can have some mesangial hypercellularity or intercapillary hypercellularity. What we do know, though, is that you have diffuse deposition of IgA, you have generally diffuse deposition of C3, and you almost never have C1Q. So the absence of C1Q implies that we probably don't have classic pathway activation. However, the presence of C3 Im I implies quite strongly that complement is somehow related uh, uh, to Ig nephropathy. So what is the complement system? So we need to do have a brief review of the complement system. So the, the classic pathway occurs when IgG mostly binds to its antigen and activates C1Q. C1Q then activates the classic pathway convertase. Okay. Our transplant colleagues measure C4D quite regularly in, in tissue. That's because it's a breakdown product of the active C4 molecule and it has a very long tissue-bound half-life so that you can stain for it in the kidney. The absence of C1Q staining suggests that we probably do not have classic pathway activation in Ig nephropathy. There's also the lectin pathway where you have mannose binding lectin um, uh, recognizing glycoproteins, which then activates a uh, mannose binding lectin associated serine protease, which is called MASP, which then also activates the classic pathway of complement. Uh, 
So it's, it's, it's the same, it's, sorry, the classic uh, a C3 convertase. So it's the same C3 convertase from the classic pathway that's activated. Now the alternate pathway is a pathway just sitting there ready to explode with rage, right? It's, got a, it's, it's usually controlled quite carefully, but when you have perhaps some slight activation through the mannose binding lectin pathway, you then get up amplification of the alternative pathway, formation of the alternative pathway C3 convertase. Either way, you then get production of the terminal membrane attack complex, which deposits into uh, uh, cell walls and causes tissue injury. The idea here is that in IG nephropathy, mannose binding lectin may be able to recognize the galactose deficient hinge region in IG nephropathy, activate the lectin pathway, and then secondarily activate the alternative pathway. So how is the alternative pathway regulated? Well, we have cell-bound regulators such as decay accelerating factor and CD59. We have cell-bound regulators, uh, including MCP, which, which acts as a cofactor to complement factor I and induces um, or facilitates breakdown of active C3B to inactive C3B. Importantly, we also have factor H, okay? So factor H is a soluble mediator of the alternate pathway. It floats around in the blood. It has a tail here that binds to the cell surface. And it has both decay accelerating factor activity as well as cofactor activity. So what am I talking about here? So in decay accelerating factor activity is the ability of complement factor H to induce breakdown of the uh, alternate pathway C3 convertase. Cofactor activity occurs when complement factor H facilitates complement factor I induced breakdown of uh, C3B to inactive C3B. So complement factor H is a very important soluble mediator, uh, a regulator of the alternate pathway of complement. So the lectin pathway has been uh, described um, for quite some time. There's original publication in 2006 in a small cohort from the Netherlands that looked at tissue staining for mannose binding lectin and discovered that it was present in around 25% of patients with IG nephropathy. In all of these patients, there was C4D staining, and in none of the patients, either with or without mannose binding lectin, was there C1Q, as we would normally expect. So patients that have mannose binding lectin staining uh, positivity in the tissue are more likely to have higher levels of proteinuria, were more likely to have crescents, and more likely to have mesangial hypercellularity, indicating that at least in 25% of patients, the lectin pathway at the time of biopsy might have been quite active. These findings were repeated by a Spanish cohort in 2014. Uh, they used only C4D staining as a marker of lectin pathway activation. What they found is that, uh, again, around 40% of patients had C4D staining in the glomeruli. They tended to have higher proteinuria and lower GFR. However, interestingly, in this study, there was no difference in histologic measures of activity, such as mesangial hypercellularity or endocapillary hypercellularity. They did, however, show that patients that were C4D positive were at higher risk of progression to end-stage renal disease. Uh, just over fourfold higher. Interestingly, they then adjusted for other predictors and showed a persistent association, although I would point out the point estimates attenuated quite substantially when they adjusted for these, and they arguably did not really adjust for all relevant predictors. So whether C4D remains an independent predictor of outcome, I don't know, but it does appear that it seems to be involved in the severity of disease, at least in some, in some patients. So what about MAS-3 levels? This is a study done by Matthew Pickering from the Imperial, uh, Imperial College. MAS-3 is a, um, uh, one of the mannose binding uh, lectin associated serum proteases, but it actually it inhibits the lectin pathway by, competitively, uh, by, by competing with MAS-1 and MAS-2. So the more MAS-3 you have, the less lectin pathway activation you have. So in IG nephropathy, pati uh, patients had lower MAS-3 levels than controls, and patients who had progressive disease had still lower MAS-3 than patients without progressive disease. And patients who had M1 hypercellularity had lower MAS-3 than patients that had M0. What about complement factor H-related protein? So there have been multiple GWAS studies done in IG nephropathy. This is one by Christoph Kierlich, published in Nature Genetics in 2014 using a, a very large cohort of Europeans as well as Chinese patients with ancestry match controls. So this is a Manhattan plot across the entire genome. You have a, uh, your p-value for association with development of IG nephropathy. The dotted line here is your genome-wide significance threshold, and everything in pink is a genetic uh, a risk factor for developing IG nephropathy. Many of them are involved in um, uh, measures of immunity or the enteric uh, immune system. However, right here, we have a gene in the complement factor H related one uh, to three um, uh, gene structure where deletions of these genes were actually protective against IG nephropathy. So we're going to come back to this in a second. 
the, they developed a, a genetic risk score. So it turns out that your genetic predisposition to developing IG nephropathy accounts for only about 7% of the incidence of disease. So it's really quite a small uh, contributor to the overall incidence of IG nephropathy. However, interestingly, it may explain the genetic uh, or the geographic variability in, in the disease. So when you look at the genetic risk score across the population, you can see that there's an increased genetic risk from west to east continental Eurasia, as well as from south to north, which uh, mirrors quite perfectly the geographic distribution of IG nephropathy, with areas in East and Southeast Asia having the highest genetic risk scores. So what is complement factor H-related protein? Well, here's sort of a cartoon structure of complement factor H and then the related proteins. There's a C-terminal that is the um, cell surface binding uh, region, and then there's an N-terminal, which is the part involved in complement regulation. So complement factor H-related proteins have the same C-terminal, but they lack the, um, the, the N-terminal that, that regulates uh, complement. So the, the theory is that complement factor H-related proteins can bind to the cell surface and then competitively inhibit complement factor H. So this is a process we call complement factor H deregulation. So what I mean by that is complement factor H-related proteins inhibit either the decay accelerating factor activity or the cofactor activity of complement factor H. So you have less complement factor H act, uh, activity, therefore more alternate pathway activity. So based on this, there were actually two back-to-back -back publications in KI in 2017, both from um, Matt Pickering's U uh, Imperial College group as well as the Spanish uh, uh, group that looked at complement factor H-related proteins and impressively from two different, completely different cohorts showed essentially the same results. So what they showed is that higher complement factor H-related uh, uh, one protein to complement factor H levels were associated with a higher risk of disease progression and were associated with um, uh, more frequent presence of endocapillary hypocellularity, but again, not mesangial hypocellularity. The Spanish group, again, looked at the same finding in terms of complement factor H-related one protein ratio to complement factor H, suggesting higher complement factor H-related protein levels were associated, were, were seen in patients with IG nephropathy compared to controls, and in patients with progressive disease versus non-progressive disease. Importantly, this, this um, uh, association was maintained when you adjust for renal function, because as GFR goes down, you tend to accumulate complement factor H-related proteins in the blood. And it was also independent of the number of gene deletions you had in that region, because recall the more gene deletions were actually protective for, for IG nephropathy. So what about tissue? So the same, the same Imperial College group subsequently went and, and, and stained um, kidney tissue for complement factor H and complement factor H related five. So what they demonstrated is that patients um, uh, with progressive disease tended to have less complement factor H staining in the tissue and more staining for the complement factor H related proteins. Again, suggesting an imbalance between these two might be contributing to disease progression. So again, what the hell am I talking about here? So, so you know, complement abnormalities probably do not uh, directly result in deposition of your galactose deficient immune complexes, but they may mediate the tissue response once that deposition occurs. That can either be through increased lectin pathway activation, which we detect through C4D, or through um, uh, abnormal regulation of the alternate pathway, uh, either one of which causes increased complement activation, increased membrane attack complex formation, and results in progressive IG nephropathy, and maybe the link between deposition of the immune complexes and histologic disease severity. So with that in mind, let's talk about new therapeutic approaches in IG nephropathy, and I'm going to highlight some of the clinical trials that we have ongoing uh, in British Columbia to try and pique your interest. So in terms of novel therapeutics in IG nephropathy, really there, there's been a surge of interest targeting all pathways of our multi-hit hypothesis here. So uh, even like Plaquenil, for example, inhibits toll-like receptors. So there's a clinical trial ongoing for Plaquenil. There's the idea of targeted release budesonide, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. There's the concept of BAF inhibition, trying to reduce B-cell activation. We have attempted to target anti-glycan antibody production. Unfortunately, it turns out rituximab does not work, probably. Uh, in a study done by Richard Lafayette in, in California did not demonstrate a benefit, but there is additional research looking at, for example, proteasome inhibitors. There's the nonspecific inflammatory uh, uh, targeting of systemic corticosteroids, as well as there's a, a trial that we're waiting the results on for a, a spleen tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which again is targeting that pathway that might be involved in the mesangial cell as a response to immune complex deposition. And then there's targeting the complement system, whether you're targeting terminal complement, 
uh, uh, through ecolizumab or other, other pathways, targeting the lectin pathway through MASP2 or targeting the alternate pathway selectively. So probably one of the most influential papers to actually stimulate interest in this is an initiative between the Kidney Health Initiative and the FDA in the United States where they did a, a trial level analysis trying to look at proteinuria as a surrogate outcome measure in IG nephropathy. And what they demonstrated is that across clinical trials, the treatment effect on proteinuria uh, over the first six to nine months post-treatment was a relatively good surrogate marker for the treatment effect on longer term renal outcomes. Based on this study, the FDA has now accepted proteinuria as a short-term marker of disease progression for expedited drug approval in IG nephropathy. So the idea here is that a pharmaceutical company can show an effect on proteinuria, get early drug approval, and the FDA has mandated a need for longer-term follow-up to confirm correlation with GFR, but there is a pathway towards drug approval in the United States based on proteinuria. Now, whether that's right or wrong, we don't know, but certainly this publication and that decision, which, which was in, in collaboration with the FDA, has stimulated a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical interest, uh, industry in, in IG nephropathy. So first, let's talk about targeted release budesonide. So budesonide is certainly not a new, a new uh, therapy, right? It's been around forever. But what's proprietary here is the capsule that, uh, that, in, uh, that um, encapsulates the budesonide that targeted, targets its release into the terminal ileum at payers patches that we think are, are predominantly involved in the mucosal step one um, uh, part of the pathogenesis of IG nephropathy. So it's, it, the idea here is to target the local immunity that contributes to the production of galactose deficient IG1 molecules and that budesonide has high first pass metabolism so it gets metabolized in the liver and therefore limits systemic exposure to significant corticosteroid levels. So there was a phase two trial called the Nefigen trial. This was published in The Lancet in 2017 of 150 patients randomized to various doses of budesonide versus placebo. They demonstrated that the systemic exposure was equivalent to around prednisone of eight milligrams per day. So it's not that you have no corticosteroid exposure, it's just that it's quite low. What they demonstrated was that there was a significant reduction in proteinuria over the first nine months, which is the treatment period, but impressively proteinuria reduction persisted three months after treatment was terminated. Proteinuria went down by around 30% in the treatment group versus not changing in the placebo group. They also demonstrated that GFR was stable in the treatment group but declined over the course of follow-up in, in, in the placebo group. So based on these phase two results, there's now the phase three trial, which we are currently recruiting for in British Columbia, uh, uh, recruiting patients with IG nephropathy who have proteinuria over one gram per day and a GFR over 35 on maximally tolerated RAS blockade. Prior treatment with immunosuppression is acceptable as long as it's one year prior to entering the study and patients are being randomized to budesonide versus placebo. Now much in line with the FDA proposal, there are two parts to this trial. The short term part, which is looking at proteinuria reduction at nine months, which again is the intent of this is for expedited drug approval through the FDA. And then a long term part looking at the correlation with GFR reduction, which is again mandated by the FDA uh, uh, for, for, uh, for longer term follow up. So, so in this trial, we're really looking for patients that have perhaps an intermediate risk of disease progression. We need to be happy leaving them on placebo for up to six years. This is ideally suited, therefore, for patients who are at sort of an intermediate risk of progression, not patients that you would otherwise really like to treat with corticosteroids under normal clinical practice, or conversely, patients that have previously tried steroids and have failed, or for whatever reason you don't think should be exposed to high levels of systemic corticosteroids. The next, uh, next therapeutic option we're looking at is monoclonal antibodies to MASP2. So MASP2, uh, it, again, is um, part of the lectin pathway. So mannose binding lectin, uh, the theory is that it recognizes the galactose deficient hinge region uh, in, in, in your galactose deficient IgA1 molecule. It then activates the MASP2 enzyme, which activates the uh, classic uh, C3 convertase and activates the lectin pathway. So that an antibody to MASP2 is a selective inhibitor of the lectin pathway. Because you're selectively inhibiting the lectin pathway, there's really no risk of meningococcal infection here. In fact, patients that are genetically deficient in the lectin pathway have really no increased risk of infection at all. It's been given to healthy volunteers, patients with TMA, as well as C3G patients with, with few side effects. However, the sum total of exposure of this drug in IG nephropathy has been given to four patients. That's it. Uh, so I took this for, directly from the pharmaceutical company. There's obviously very strong uh, translational science uh, to support the lectin pathway as I presented, 
However, really it's been given to only four patients who tolerated it well and did have a reduction in proteinuria over the three months of treatment that persisted for an additional few months after treatment finished. So based on this limited experience as well as the translational science, the uh, company's moving forward with a phase three trial, uh, again looking at um, uh, uh, patients with uh, proteinuria over one gram per day. Previous treatment to immunosuppression is acceptable. The drug is being, it's an intravenous drug given weekly for 12 weeks and then stopped for 12 weeks and then it's redosed based on proteinuria response. So if the proteinuria relapses, it gets redosed. If it doesn't relapse, you stay off of it. And it's being compared to placebo, which is dosed similarly. Again, there are two parts to the study, a short-term part for proteinuria reduction uh, designed for FDA drug approval, and then a long-term part to correlate with GFR over time. So again, similar to the Nefegard trial, we're looking for intermediate risk patients that you would feel comfortable leaving on placebo or patients that should not be exposed to corticosteroids or if previously uh, um, um, a failed corticosteroid. The final molecule we're looking at uh, in the clinical trial in BC is called simdiserin, which is very interesting. It's, it, it, it produces selective C5 gene knockdown in the hepatocyte. So what this is, is it uses the concept of small interfering RNA molecules that are bound to a glycoprotein with a receptor that exists only on hepatocytes. So you give the drug, it's, 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 it's targeted to hepatocytes and then rapidly cleared from the systemic circulation. It then gets incorporated into an enzyme called RISC, which interferes with mRNA translation of the C5 protein. So basically, it selectively reduces C5 protein production in the liver. Turns out that C5 is only produced in the liver, so that you end up, therefore, with a terminal in, uh, inhibition of the terminal membrane attack complex. The drug is administered subcutaneously. After a single dose, you can see that you get this clamp pharmacodynamic uh, uh, effect where you have C5 that it, it does take time to reduce, so it takes about 30 to 40 days to come down, and then it stays down for about 120 days after a single dose. However, because it inhibits the membrane, the, the, the terminal pathway of complement, we think the risk of meningococcal infection is quite similar uh, to that of ecolizumab, so that needs to be considered. And it's been given to healthy volunteers, um, again, with no serious adverse events. So there's now a phase two trial. So this is not looking for drug approval. This is looking for a signal that it might be beneficial in IG nephropathy to subsequently inform a phase three trial. So again, we're looking for patients with IgA that have uh, GFRs over 30. This study protocol is also requiring hematuria as a surrogate marker for disease activity. You know, how good of a surrogate marker that is, uh, you know, we could argue about for a while. But um, the patients also need to be willing to receive the meningococcal vaccine because of that inhibition of the terminal membrane attack complex. Patients can, uh, again, have been received, uh, immunosuppression is acceptable. Patients uh, undergo an eight-month placebo control period in which they are given simdiserin monthly uh, via subcutaneous injection versus placebo. However, the interesting part of this study is it's followed by an open-label extension period in which all patients, regardless of treatment arm, get access to an additional year of treatment. So the idea here is that we could potentially recruit patients at higher risk of disease progression. You might not want to keep on placebo for a long period of time in one of the previous two studies, but for certainly for eight months would not be, uh, would not be a terrible idea, but then all patients get access to targeted complement inhibition for, for IG nephropathy. So I think that this is a very exciting time for drug development in IG nephropathy. We have multiple therapeutic options now that target specific pathways in IG nephropathy that are being studied. I think five years from now, we will not be talking about corticosteroids anymore. We will be talking about targeted treatments. These clinical trials offer patients access to novel treatments, and it offers treatment options in patients that either can't get corticosteroids or have previously failed these options. A very important point here is that all of these studies are industry-sponsored. I, I personally have no academic involvement or financial relationships with any of the, 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 uh, the companies doing these trials. However, I, you know, I, I, do, I do feel that we should support these studies because, as I, I, you know, again, this is our only pathway towards really new treatment options for IG nephropathy. So in summary, I think if you have any patient that you think um, with IG nephropathy that you think you may or may not want to treat with, with, with corticosteroids but might qualify for these trials, just refer them to the clinic and I can, can discuss the different trial options with them. Certainly the different protocol intensities may have different implications for patients that come from different regions in the, in the lower mainland versus throughout the province. I know that Interior Health is looking at recruiting um, for the Nefergard trial directly in, in IHA, so that may facilitate recruitment as well. Um, we can try and get some of these patients in, into trials. So I'm going to stop there. I'd like to thank my sources of funding, uh, my statistical collaborators,
My Canadian collaborator is both in IGA as well as Daniel Schwartz, who's helped with QXMD, and then my multiple international collaborators that really uh, uh, were very instrumental in providing data for the, for the prediction modeling uh, uh, work. Thank you. Uh, sorry, David and then Sean. Do where the tie you had uh, more than enough uh, data to uh, keep my attention. I never looked at your tie. Uh, um, I'm just having a little trouble getting my head around the concept about quality of life and not needing the value in order to um, satisfy the prediction model. Does that mean you're assuming that the negative effect on quality of life is the same in a uh, with a, with treatment uh, versus uh, the, the converse when, when the patient then uh, doesn't get treated and then progresses? Uh, because if I'm just having trouble getting my head around it, if treatment is very benign, it has no big big effect on quality of life. How come that wouldn't uh, weight it differently? Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a good question. It's by no means easy to get your, your head around this concept. So, so this, this modeling strategy was developed by a, a group of people that felt that it was necessary to look at the implications and treatment decisions to understand whether prediction modeling um, you know, would actually have a meaningful impact in clinical care. However, they acknowledged the absence of quality of life data that makes it almost you know, impossible to do that moving forward in the question. So, so working your way backwards, basically it relies on the concept of this threshold probability and, and the quality of life issues basically cancel out in the numerator and denominator when you look at the relative effects of a false positive versus false negative treatment decision. The, the issue though is it doesn't tell you what the threshold probability should be. It just tells you what the benefits could be across all threshold probabilities. For you to know what that threshold probability should be, you need to know actually what the quality of life is. You need to know what the impact of steroid treatment is, and you need to be able to weigh that against the quality of life uh, uh, of disease progression. So for example, if you take something like corticosteroids that have a relatively substantial um, uh, side effect profile, you need to go ask patients how they value the quality of life from steroid treatment compared to the potential quality of life implications of end-stage renal disease work your way forward to identify a threshold probability that honestly for corticosteroids is probably going to be pretty high. So your choice of threshold is going to depend on the relative side effects of treatment versus progression to ESRD. Conversely, if you have a treatment that is relatively benign, um, you know, then you imagine that threshold might actually be much lower. So, so you, need, you, you do need to, work, to identify quality of life in order to work your way forward to tell you what to do in, in clinical practice. It's more of a demonstration of the potential benefit of treatment decisions based on a prediction model um, across a range of hypothetical threshold probabilities. So it's not specific to any one immunosuppression. Um, Shauna? Um, I just uh, have a question about the um, the risk prediction model and the blood pressure component of it. It said uh, it's blood pressure at time of biopsy. Is that considered an in-office blood pressure or their whole blood pressure around the time of biopsy? Like which blood pressure should we be using for the patient for that? Uh, yeah, so, so keep in mind, we, we extracted this from observational data, right? So um, we do not uh, have details on when or how the blood pressure was measured. We just have the day it was measured on and the value. So for a lot of the um, Chinese cohorts, which were very large in this study, they were actually measured at the time of, they admitted all their patients to hospital and um, measured them at the time of hospital admission, which is actually the day of the biopsy. So you, know, you can envision that that's probably pretty well controlled blood pressure, um, but realistically, you, it, it's sort of an all-encompassing capture of, of blood pressure uh, that has not been standardized in this kind of observational data. Jane? So Xiaomi, thanks for the talk. I find the complement component very interesting because it's very similar to what we see in transplantation. Now there's a dominant pathway of injury involving complement, but also there's other uh, pathways involved as well. One of the concerns about the trials in, in IGA, the, the ones you've listed, is that um, many of the complement medications in transplant have failed. 
And mainly because we did not risk stratify patients prior to entry into the, uh, the trials. For instance, if a patient's dominant injury pathway is not complement mediated and you're giving this patient complement inhibition, that's not going to translate to outcomes. I noticed in all three trials that it's not required to have an incident biopsy prior to enrollment. So if I have a patient for whom I've treated with steroids and they've responded, they have some residual proteinuria, they may qualify for the trial. However, if I biopsy them, they may have no actually injury. And then I'm giving them complement inhibition when I, in fact, may not have been the, the uh, cause of the pathway. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. So I have argued blue in the face with uh, companies about the need for more refined biopsy criteria. And, you know, the problem is, is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the major key opinion leaders in this area come from the United States, and they're very reticent to re-biopsy patients. Even if the patients had a biopsy followed by immunosuppression, followed by meeting the inclusion criteria, my argument would be you have no idea what's going on in the biopsy. So I would, I would suggest, although it's not strictly speaking required for entry into the study, you know, if you've referred a patient to clinic who has previously been treated with immunosuppression that has a concerning clinical pathway for, I'm not sure if there's scarring or if there's activity or both, you know, I may choose to re-biopsy that patient before entering them into the trial, even though it's not strictly speaking an inclusion criteria. Because I agree with you. I think that if you do not have activity of some sort, you know, it doesn't need to be M1, but there needs to be some esangial hypercellularity or something going on. I don't think it's ethically reasonable to randomize that or to enroll that patient in an immunosuppression trial, or, nor is it reasonable to treat them with immunosuppression outside of the trial. So, so I, I do think we need to risk stratify patients according to more proximal measures of disease activity. The challenge is, is that outside of a biopsy, we don't know what those actually are. There, all the studies are capturing a biomarker evidence of complement activation so that after the fact, we might be able to stratify the results to determine if there's a subgroup of patients that have perhaps biomarker evidence of lectin pathway activation, and that, pa that patient may benefit from MASP2 inhibition versus if there isn't, you know, you may want to try a terminal complement uh, inhibitor because uh, recall only about 25% of patients to 30% of patients have mannose binding lectin staining at the time of a biopsy, right? So it is conceivable the lectin pathway may be important at one stage of the disease, but the alternate pathway takes over, you know, at another stage. And again, we don't know that. And we don't know enough about biomarker stratification to make that, that decision non-invasively. Yeah, and I think we can do a lot of things already in the lab. I mean, before we give someone C5 gene knockdown, we can actually stain for, you know, MAC um, formation in the tissue. And yeah, the, that, that the challenge with that is that that has been, that has been um, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the, but the MAC staining has been uh, quite controversial. So, for example, in um, C3G or in atypical HUS, uh, tissue-bound MAC staining uh, is not necessarily predictive of uh, drug response. And, you know, one of the, one of the, rash, one of the problems um, might be that uh, it has a long half-life, right? And so, so it can stick around for a while. I, I, it would be, um, I tend to use it, for example, in C3G to try to decide, you know, if, if there's evidence that inhibition of, the, of MAC might be helpful in that, in that patient. We can get tissue-bound MAC staining done in Quebec if we absolutely need it. Um, but again, it hasn't been studied well enough to really prospectively make treatment decisions. We probably do need that. But in order to do that, you need a biopsy that is quite close to entry into the trial, right? Like if, if you have a biopsy from 10 years ago, it's hopeless. So it's a great conversation, and um, I think what you've done is highlighted for us like how exciting GN in general and IGA is and all the ways that we can actually use both our biopsies as well as risk prediction tools. Um, it's 20 to 9, and <laughs> so I think we need to end it now, but it was really an outstanding talk, very comprehensive and uh, very exciting for those of you that are just starting nephrology to know that there's lots of different